Good afternoon. My name is Jacob Powell, General Agricultural Extension Agent for Sherman and Wasco Counties with OSU Extension Service. Thanks for joining our webinar this afternoon covering a wildfire dispensable, defensible space for the farm and ranch. The goal of this webinar today, kind of our agenda is that Ariel Cowan here is a Central Oregon Regional Fire Extension Specialist with OSU and she's going to get us started talking about the home ignition zone for the farm and ranch. I think it's important that kind of the basis of wildfire defensible space, be it just for your home or for your property, you know, all kind of starts with the basic home ignition zone principles that then you can kind of expand out at a greater scale across your operation. So Ariel's going to get us started on that and I'm going to expand on kind of how we can think more about wildfire defensible space expanded into some more of our more agricultural and cropland areas as well. So thanks Ariel. With that, I'll hand it over to you and let us get started. Great. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, so welcome everyone. Glad you could join us uh, for your lunch hour on this beautiful day and um, happy to talk to you about uh, wildfire dispensable defensible space and more specifically about home ignition zones for farm and ranch. So first I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Ariel Cowan and as Jacob was saying, I'm the regional fire specialist for Central Oregon. And I'm part of Oregon State University Extension's new fire program, which focuses on outreach and education on all things fire with the goal of empowering our communities to reduce fire risk. So uh, maybe some of you have heard about this new fire program. So I'm just gonna briefly introduce the team. Uh, we have a program manager, Carrie Berger, state fire specialist, Daniel Lavelle, um, and they're uh, located in, in Corvallis at the OSU campus. Um, but we have uh, six regional fire specialists that are strategically placed around the state. Um, and so as you can see, I'm in the center here for the central region. And uh, this is a pretty big region, but I have for the most part, uh, the East Slope of the Cascades. And uh, what's great is that each te team member brings a unique background. Um, and so we all learn from each other, share information and resources. And if anyone lives near the border of these regional areas, then uh, you actually can have, can have access to more than one regional fire specialist that can answer questions and help you out. Um, so uh, actually two other of these regional fire specialists you may hear from in future webinars um, that's related to uh, wildfire defensible space um, topics and um, for farm and ranch. So we have John Rizza in the Northeast and in the Southeast, Katie Wolstein. And uh, Katie Wolstein is actually our uh, rangeland fire specialist. So uh, always excited to learn a lot from her about rangeland fire. And so if you wanna learn more, you can check out our website uh, and there's a, a whole series of webinars that we've got there. Some of them are already recorded and we have uh, a few that are coming up. For example, one that we are giving tomorrow at this time uh, is going to be about the different evacuation levels and how to prepare uh, a go bag. So check that out. So for today's talk, uh, I'm gonna be focusing more on home ignition zones for farm and ranch. And so just a, a, a brief outline, I'm gonna go over uh, what fuel is, uh, different types of fuel, fuel arrangement, and then how that relates to um, how buildings burn. And so uh, that's you know very important to uh, point out how buildings actually do ignite, um, because then that can relate to what we can do in home ignition zones um, to reduce our, our fire risk. So there are many ways to keep fire from devastating our crops and grazing land but I'm going to focus on how we can keep fire from devastating our homes and outbuildings uh, through what is called the home ignition zone or HIZ. And so before we continue, I want to acknowledge that uh, wildfire can be a traumatic experience for those who have survived them. Uh, so for those of you who have lost homes or property due to wildfire, uh, you have our condolences for your difficult time. And uh, the next series of slides will show images of embers showering a home and structures uh, burning. And so I just wanna say that these uh, images are really from simulations 
from research. So in order to understand what we can do about our wildfire risk, uh, it's good to uh, think about fire behavior. And so fire behavior depends on many factors. Uh, this is the classic fire behavior triangle. Um, and it can mostly be um, boiled down to weather, topography, and fuel. And fuel being any flammable material, including vegetation in a forest, a grass field, or rangeland, or even the materials in our home. Uh, so we can't control topography, and we can't really control the weather. I, I'd like to, but we can't. Um, but interestingly, we have the ability to influence the fuels around our properties, and that's where we can really make a difference. So just to talk about different types of fuel, uh, recognizing that the types of fuel around you will help you identify maintenance and landscaping goals around your home. Uh, fuels in this photo are anything from the dry and dead grass, the dead and alive needles on the tree um, or on the ground, uh, the shrubs, the tree branches and the tree trunk, uh, and even the stump in the background. And so this next photo might look a little more familiar for those who are a little further east or um, in uh, areas with juniper woodlands. And uh, you know the native bitter brush is a fuel and the juniper is fuel as well, but that doesn't mean that we have to remove all of them. Uh, but you will want to manage for overgrowth of this type of vegetation and uh, especially with fuels like juniper, bitter brush and different types of conifers, whether it be um, dug fir or pine, um, because they contain flammable oils. Um, and those flammable oils uh, have an influence on um, uh, flame lengths and producing embers. So uh, our homes and landscaping is also considered fuel, um, as good as they may look. And so there are ways that we can still have nice looking landscaping, and at the same time, protect your home from fire. And I know that a lot of trees were planted for the purpose of windbreaks and shade over our homes, but we want to um, take another look at how they're growing, where they are placed, and what maintenance needs to be done so that they don't become a fire hazard. Uh, likewise, the material used on the outside of the home should also be assessed because our homes and buildings themselves are fuel. So I want to share this great table on the different types of fuel and how they respond to their environment. Uh, so grass and um, pine needles or leaves um, and small branches, those are fine and small fuels. And uh, I just want you to focus on this part of the table that uh, they respond the most to their environment. They respond very quickly. Uh, for example, it's been very dry the last couple of weeks. And so these are the fuels, types of fuels that will dry out first. Um, and that is as opposed to the larger trunks or the stems or uh, stumps on the ground that they're more resistant to um, those environmental changes, it would take um, a whole fire season before some of them become dry enough. And so it, it's, it's important to think about the small uh, to medium fuels um, because they're actually what we need to watch out for the most since they can dry so quickly and they can catch fire very easily, quickly spreading fire around. Um, so this includes the pine needles accumulating on your roof or the conifer shrubs that have lots of dead branches that's next to your fence. Um, so for um, all of you who know how to build a good campfire, um, you'll know that you can't just start a campfire with a, a bunch of logs, uh, that you need to gather and light kindling in order to get your campfire going. So the same holds true for wildfires. Uh, they need the small fuels to act as kindling. And so the really large fuels are um, not as big of a concern as long as there's not too, you know, a, a whole lot of them, um, but it's really these fine, small, medium fuels where um, we can 
focus the most uh, in order to halt the spread of wildfire. So I talked about the types of fuels to manage, uh, but let's talk about the spatial arrangement of fuels. When there are continuous uh, fuels that are close together, they can easily spread fire along the ground or the surface. So examples uh, include tall, dry grasses, uh, lots of shrubs all next to each other, um, or an example I've seen in landscaping, uh, evergreen hedges. And so if they're all touching, if they're connected or close to each other, then they can spread as a continuous fuel. Now, ladder fuels are another big one to watch out for. So that's more of a vertical fuel, whereas this is like a horizontal fuel. Um, and so ladder fuels allow fire to spread from the ground up into the canopies of trees. And examples of ladder fuels could be smaller trees next to larger trees, uh, shrubs or tall grass growing beneath trees, or really low hanging branches of trees. So this leads into how the spatial arrangement of fuels can ignite homes and buildings. Fire following ladder fuels up into the canopy can rain embers that can ignite your roof um, or ignite the, the material that is accumulated on your roof, the plant material like leaves or needles. Whereas the continuous fuels uh, uh, can spread direct flames to your deck, your fences, or directly to your home. So most homes burn because of flying embers. And embers can travel far ahead of an advancing wildfire if there's enough wind. So the data indicates that 60 to 90% of homes are ignited due to flying embers. Um, not uh, necessarily from the main front of a wild, wildfire. More houses ignite and burn uh, as a result of exposure to windblown embers than any other cause. And so this photo here shows a house ignited from flying embers that landed on this cedar shake roof that the, the fire had actually started on the ground. So here's some great videos um, from IBHS. And uh, basically, it's just showing from research a simulation of a wildfire and embers that are flying in at uh, a home in, in this uh, scenario. And so embers collect in the gutters, roofs, uh, corners, and crevices of your home. And so uh, these are areas that to focus on to uh, try to inhibit uh, embers from igniting the actual materials of your home. And so this photo here shows from some of the same research, uh, an ember hardened house on the right versus standard construction uh, igniting from flying embers. And so uh, strategies to avoid ignition would be to harden your home uh, and you can do this by replacing or altering the construction materials with material, materials that are more fire resistant, um, and then also creating and maintaining defensible space. So when assessing materials and maintenance, you want to start by looking at the top of the home and then working your way down, looking at the different materials on the side of your home, all the way down to the ground, and then from there on out uh, the areas that are closer to your home and then further out away from your home. So uh, you, know, you can focus on whenever you're doing an assessment of your own home or, or buildings on your property. Think about start from the top and then go move down and then out. So starting at the top, uh, if we think about roofs and roofing, roofing material, uh, if you recall from that image I showed earlier, earlier of a shake, cedar shake roof, uh, those uh, types of roofing material, those shingles are very flammable. Um, and so some of the more resistant roofing material would be composite 
uh, roof. Um, and uh, uh, you could also have metal roofing material. I've seen some folks use those Spanish ceramic tiles for roofs. Um, and I would say for those, just to make sure that any of the open areas uh, around the tile are sealed because that's a, um, an area where uh, dead plant material can accumulate. Um, so focusing on the material that the roofs are made of. <clears throat> and then also, also thinking about, uh, is your roof complex? Um, I know for some folks, they have, you know, different windows that are coming out in certain areas or, you know, uh, different um, uh, floors or, or heights of their roofing. And so the more complicated your roof is, the more uh, crevices and areas where uh, dead plant material can accumulate. So you wanna make sure that you're focusing on not just what the roof is made of, but also the maintenance of your roof. Um, and then also you wanna focus on gutters. If you have gutters, making sure that they are cleaned out on a regular basis. And then if you have skylights, that's another area where I've seen uh, dead plant material accumulate. And those are all at risk of um, uh, being a place where if embers were to arrive, that uh, then that, that could ignite the roof. Uh, so then I want you to take a look at the vents and the eaves of your home or buildings. And so there's lots of different um, construction methods, constr you know, different vent types, different eaves types. Um, you have uh, open eaves or boxed eaves. Uh, boxed eaves are going to be better at keeping embers out um, of your home, out of the attic of your home. Um, and so one method to really help with that is installing eighth inch uh, metal screening uh, on your vents and your eaves. Um, so that really helps to prevent those embers from getting in there. So next you would wanna take a look at siding, uh, you know, what the kind of material they've used. Um, there's uh, examples of uh, uh, cement that has, uh, looks like wood board, but it's actually cement and those are really great. Um, fire resistant siding, um, there's, there's lots of other examples. If you have wood siding, yes, that's flammable, but there are some ways that you can uh, do a, a treatment, a coating on that wood siding, but I'd want you to think about um, how, uh, how many times, how much time and money it would take to um, have to reapply that coating. So the, those are things to consider. Um, and I know that a lot of this can sound very expensive, so you can focus on one thing each year um, and work towards uh, you know, either altering or switching out some of these materials if you want your homes and your buildings to be um, the most uh, ember resistant. Uh, so then after looking at siding, you want to focus on windows, making sure that they are tempered and double paned. Um, so those will be the most resistant. And then for decks, porches, and fences, um, I know some of us have these fantastic wood uh, decks and porches, um, and those can also get a, a, a coating that's fire resistant, but I would say the best thing to do would be to work towards trying to replace with more uh, fire resistant materials, um, whether it be fiber cement deck boards uh, or maybe a tile patio or something like that. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about uh, what you can do around decks in a moment. So I just wanted to show more of these great videos um, on on these simulations with embers. And uh, here we see an example with vents and with these vent openings, if um, they don't have that eighth inch mesh screen, how it's really easy for, you can kind of see it, some of these embers to come in and they can ignite the particle board or any kind of flammable material that you have um, in there. So that's a gable end vent. Um, there's lots of different types of vents, but still uh, there's a benefit of having that eighth inch mesh screen over them. And then here's an example of an open eave um, that somebody had placed quarter inch mesh um, and how many embers were coming in uh, from using that kind of mesh. 
whereas the eighth inch mesh really um, made a bigger difference in preventing the embers from coming in. Okay, so that was more about home hardening. Uh, so that was really um, focusing on that top down um, look at uh, assessment of um, the materials and maintenance of your home. And now getting into the nitty gritty of the actual home and building ignition zone or HIZ. And so these have three different zones starting at uh, closer to your home. Uh, the immediate zone is zero to five feet around your home, but that's also including around uh, like a patio or fenced area or a porch. And then the second zone is the intermediate zone and that's five to 30 feet, which you will wanna keep lean, clean and green. I'll go into what that means. And then for the extended zone, uh, it's more 30 to 100 feet out from around your home or around buildings. And so there you wanna focus more on thinning, pruning and separating those fuels that are there. So the HIZ really just serves as a guide to help home homeowners create an effective defensible space around their home. And uh, these guidelines aim to protect homes, not only from wildfires themselves, but also from ignition from those embers that I was talking about earlier. So getting into the immediate zone, zero to five feet, uh, we really want this area to be as non-combustible as possible. So some great uh, examples of what you can do in this zone is considering uh, using rock, gravel, or I've seen some people put in a concrete path or use pavers in this zone. And I should say you can still have some plants in this zone like succulents or um, bulbs or you know, some flowering plants that um, remain really moist, but I would avoid um, woody plants, I would avoid shrubs in this zone. And I really wanna bring up that um, it's uh, good to avoid using mulch, even bark mulch um, in this zone because even bark can ignite if it's hot enough or dry enough. And uh, recently, actually just a couple weeks ago, there was a fire in central Oregon where someone had a, a meat smoker and uh, some embers were coming out of the smoker and ignited the mulch that they had right next to their home. And sure enough, the mulch was burning and it led to a wood deck. The deck burnt down, uh, the siding on that side of the house had burned. And uh, thankfully, first responders got there quick enough to put out the fire, so they saved the home. But that is you know, a big concern. A lot of people like to use mulch right next to their home, and really these options are going to be better for you. Uh, so another thing with the immediate zone would be decks, uh, fences, and lawn furniture. So for decks, uh, I know that um, a lot of Folks like to store their firewood on their decks or uh, underneath the eaves of their homes um, in order to keep them dry and really close by for use. Um, but unfortunately, this is a big fire hazard. So uh, we recommend that you keep your firewood stacks uh, at least 30 feet away from the home. So um, outside of the immediate, outside of the even the intermediate zone. Um, and I already talked about deck materials and what you can do about that. Um, but I also want you to think about underneath your decks. Um, so doing maintenance underneath your decks uh, is really good to uh, reduce the possibility of ignition. Uh, so a lot of dead plant material, needles, leaves, they accumulate under decks. Uh, sometimes you have some like burrowing creatures that like to make a nest. So it's really good to get under there and rake out that material. Uh, place some gravel down under there, and to even um, avoid having to do too much maintenance underneath your deck, you can put um, eighth inch mesh screen um, along the deck as well. So that, that will help a lot. And then I, I also wanna say that I, I know, um, I've done this before, I've been guilty of this, uh, using the space underneath my deck as storage. And so that's another thing that we really want to avoid because 
that often ends up being flammable material and increases a fire hazard if you use the space under your deck as storage. And so for fences, um, if you have a wood fence, um, sure it would be great to replace that with a non-combustible material, um, but that's a lot of work <laughs> and that's a lot of fence for many people. So at the very least, I would say the area that connects to your buildings and your homes to replace that portion with something that is more non-combustible like metal or something like that. And that way that kind of breaks the continuity of the fuel so that if this fence were to ignite, it wouldn't just spread a fire straight to your home, if that makes sense. And for lawn furniture, uh, it's great to have non-combustible lawn furniture, metal, things like that. But I know um, that a lot of folks like to use uh, that nice kind of padding on their lawn furniture. Uh, that stuff is very flammable. So I would say during extreme fire season, uh, it would be good to bring those things inside or store them. But don't store them underneath your deck. Yeah. <laughs> um, so getting into the intermediate zone. Uh, so that's five to 30 feet. And uh, so I mentioned lean, clean, and green. And this is really the area where you wanna make sure you remove dead or dried plant material. Um, and you can use low growing native shrubs in this area. And you can also have some trees, but you want them to be in small groups. And so this diagram here is nice. It shows like you can have some groupings, but make sure you break up the continuous fuels by having them at least 18 feet apart uh, from those groupings. And also I would say in this uh, zone that it would be good to prune uh, six to 10 feet above the ground for your trees. Uh, so fire resistant plants are really great to use uh, in this zone. And this is where an irrigated, well-maintained mowed lawn can be really useful and stop the spread of fire. Uh, water plants are really good to use here that, you know, I would say some su suggestions are hardwood, uh, deciduous shrubs and trees uh, because they retain more moisture and if possible to avoid those conifer shrubs. Um, if you have some conifer trees, trees already there, that's fine. Just make sure that they are pruned up, like I mentioned in the last slide. And if you're looking for some inspiration of what plants to use, uh, OSU Extension has a fire resistant plant guide for home landscapes and uh, you can find that on this website here and we'll share that link later as well. Okay, now for the extended zone. Uh, so 3200 feet out is this zone and here in this diagram they kind of split it into two, 30 to 60, 60 to 100. Um, but really the point is here you're, instead of removing all the continuous and ladder fuels, but you're remove, you're sorry, you're reducing these fuels in this section. So as you can see, now you can allow some of the trees and shrubs to be a little bit closer together, but still making sure you break up the continuous fuels. And then further out, they can be even closer together than that. And so that way you're, you know, it's like less work as you work further out away from your home. Um, but just focusing on reducing these continuous and ladder fuels, uh, still doing some thinning, some pruning, and separating out those fuels. <clears throat> and so just some guidance on pruning. This is the last note that I want to share, uh, that uh, a general rule of thumb is your la ladder fuel pruning zone uh, would be your understory vegetation and multiply that by three. So say this is a foot tall, then you know, multiply that by three, you want three feet of space in between your vegetation and the next vegetation higher up. So you have two options. You can either remove that limb to create this uh, space, or you can just remove the understory vegetation underneath the tree um, for this um, extended zone. So it's okay to leave some of these for wildlife. I get that question a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, some wildlife really like those lower limbs. So that's fine in some areas, but um, the more pruning that you do, at least around these home ignition zones, will really help to reduce your wildfire risk. And I want to say that with these zones, um, it's really, uh, 
you can increase, you can extend this zone up to 200 feet. And I definitely uh, encourage that if you have a steeper slope um, that you are living around. So uh, really, I would say that this is the minimum for minimum recommendations for the zones that you wanna focus on for reducing your wildfire risk. Okay, well, that's it for me. I went a little bit longer than I thought I would, but uh, I'll stop there to see if there are any questions for my portion of this talk. And I also just wanna say, um, I really appreciate the time and would greatly appreciate if um, anyone uh, wants to leave a review. Uh, us as OSU Extension employees, we uh, really uh, need to collect uh, our feedback on how we're doing. And so if you use your camera phone, the camera on your phone and take a picture of this QR code, it'll send you to this link and you can leave a review. Um, so I greatly appreciate that. And I'll open it up to any questions. Thank you, Ariel. Great presentation there. So there are several resources that are in the chat with different links that you feel free to look at. And also at the very bottom of the, the chat of those resources is a direct link to Ariel survey. That link will also be provided in an email that you should get later this week for attending this webinar. Thank you. All right. So well, if there I are any questions, um, feel free to type them into the chat. Um, also, we have the Q&A that you can use as well. Um, but we can pause here now, and if there aren't any questions, we'll just go ahead and jump into my presentation here. Share my screen here. Great. Thank you, Jacob, and thank you, everyone. Okay, so Ariel provides some great information there about how we can think about defensible space around our homes. And now how do we kind of expand that out to the agricultural lands around our surrounding areas? And a lot of these are agricultural lands that they're providing a lot of benefits uh, for crops, revenue, and basically food for the world. So it's important that we understand ways that we can maintain our farming uh, lifestyle and operations and still create increased safety for ourselves as well. So I do have a brief poll that's coming up that you can take a photo of this QR code with your phone. Um, there's a link there. Also, just feel free, you could type, type, type in your response to this question in the chat as well. This is basically just the halfway point to see if you're still awake. So this question here is just looking at this agricultural property, looking at this older barn here. What are some defensible steps that could be taken there? Thinking about the steps that Ariel just talked about. So, I mean, feel free in the chat um, or you can try to use that polling feature if it works for you and basically just describe a few words, you know, things that need to be addressed potentially here. We have a smaller crowd today, so this polling feature is not uh, doesn't suit our needs as well today. But anyways, just looking at this barn, the features to think about, we have a lot of flashy dryer fuels around the bottom of the barn here. That could definitely be a hazard. Um, we have some matted down grass here. That, that's going to slow down the fire behavior a little bit. But I mean, if you get an amber that lands in this flashy grass, it's going to be off to the off to the races. And somebody in the chat now did just put um, grass. I mean, that's kind of the most obvious thing that comes to mind. Uh, you have these wooden fence posts that could potentially catch on fire. It'd be better to be using metal posts at those locations. The roof looks somewhat decent, given that it's a metal roof. The other big thing is just a lot of these older structures that we have close to our, our houses. You know, often earlier generations used these for agricultural reasons that the, they actually had animals or hay in these barns, and often we don't anymore. And so the, the biggest issue is we just have all these 
openings left for those embers to come flying into. So using that eighth inch screening when we can can really help seal those structures off. And unfortunately not screening, the cost of that does add up. It takes time to do it, but it's something that we can do to help address some of these issues and improve the longevity of our structures. And hold on here, I'm having some issues getting the next slide. Okay, so as Ariel mentioned with the home ignition zone, you know, often we look at that going out to 100 feet. With agriculture, I mean, that's when you really do think about needing a, another 200 feet, basically double that 100 feet is a good concept to use. Just we have a lot of added complexity with additional uh, structures and outbuildings. We have a lot of diversity in terms of surrounding vegetation that is either native introduced species or crops that when they're within 100 feet of the home can pose pose a problem. And with agriculture, we start getting at a larger scale. Suddenly, we have enough acres that you might want to think about using some fuel breaks that you're going to either create or understand where you have some natural fuel barriers that you could encourage suppression sources being routed to in the event that you have a fire that you're concerned about. The other big thing with agriculture is often we have slash piles or just piles of debris around the farm. And the biggest culprit here is that, you know, a lot of times these debris are far enough from the house that direct flame is not an issue, but the radiant heat that these can produce can just really be detrimental. And even now we're having wildfires that are burning into agricultural crops or irrigates such as orchards. This is a picture of an apple orchard up by Wenatchee that was burned several years ago. And as you can see, it's not like there's a huge forest of surrounding fuels around this. It's more that the dry fuels that are around this are were hot and dry enough and produced enough heat that just simply the radiant heat from that surrounding vegetation is what basically pushed this fire into the orchard here. And the other thing with radiant heat, you know, it's not a direct flame length, but it's actually the heat that's being generated from all of that. And especially around here where we get such gusty winds, the wind can really be a, a vector for that heat. And that's really what happened with this apple orchard here was the, the winds were pushing it this way. So all the heat just got fallen straight into those trees. And, you know, it gets to the point that it doesn't matter how green or irrigated things are, the flames are still going to push through it if it's hot enough. Also in agricultural lands, similar to the orchard that I just showed there, we have these surrounding landscapes that are very difficult to do anything from an agricultural standpoint. So we have, you know, the kind of these barren lands that are really rocky that we can't do a lot with. And unfortunately, we still have a lot of annual plants that show up every year that really colonize these areas with large amounts of flammable fuels that are difficult for us to control. So sometimes it's hard, but maybe there's some defensible steps you can do with some of these um, pockets like this one that you're seeing here. In other cases, we just need to mitigate it in terms of of our crops and maybe give ourselves some additional buffer space or fuel breaks around some of these areas that we can't do anything with from a farming standpoint. And again, with agriculture, we've added complexity that often we have power line infrastructure running through our properties. These power lines are a source of potential fire starts. And also when we have fires, it's very hazardous to be underneath these power lines when you have heavy smoke that's going through there. So it makes it difficult for suppression resources to effectively engage the fire at those locations. We have an abundant amount of dry fuels. And often these fuels are located on very steep terrain that makes suppression efforts difficult and often it dramatically increases the fire behavior as well. And so speaking of of fuels and different fire behaviors. So this is research that was done in Australia that was just published uh, in 2020 that they did research on having controlled fires within different types of wheat fields in Australia and finding out what sort of fire behavior that created. So they found that basically an unharvested wheat field that's you know fully mature about to get harvested, you can expect on you know a calm day with no wind on flat terrain you're gonna be seeing flame lengths that are basically 12 to 16 feet long. If you have a crop that's just been harvested, it's probably gonna be more six to 7.5 feet. You're still gonna have the residue there that's gonna create fire behavior. And if we have baled wheat, which 
some producers in Wasco County and Sherman County do as well, you know, those fields are, are fairly short. And so they're, those baled fields are, are a good safety zone in a way that, you know, we have very short flame lengths that we can expect from those after they've been harvested and baled. The other fuel that we often have to worry about surrounding our wheat fields is we have a lot of cheatgrass in some of these areas. And so they found that cheatgrass, if you've got moderate fire behavior that's getting pushed by 20 mile per wind on flat terrain, you can easily see eight foot flame lengths. And so these are important when we think about doing fire breaks or creating defensible space that, I mean, you really want something that's wide enough that's gonna be, uh, you know, at least double the distance of some of these flame lengths. Uh, often these flame lengths, if you're going up a steep hill or the wind is pushing it, you know, if that flame lays completely flat on the ground, that's quite the distance. And so that's what we found too, that we have a lot of paved roads that we think are going to stop a fire. But if you have unharvested wheat fields, uh, when you have flame lengths 16 feet long, there's a good chance it's, it's going to jump the road pretty easily. So just keep that in mind. And then also the other issue is how fast are these fires spreading? And so again, unharvested wheat, Going to have fairly aggressive fire behavior that you know you could be seeing a fire going up to six miles per hour and if we have harvested wheat and baled wheat that's going to be diminished you know more to around uh, three or two miles per hour cheatgrass can also move fairly quickly it's a very flashy fuel so it doesn't create a lot of heat but it can definitely move quickly and pose a suppression concern then the other is issue is think about our kim fallow fields in the mid-Columbia and also you know across the state of Oregon that we have areas that historically were in fallow this is what they look like not a lot of fuels out there to carry a fire very effective at stopping it now we have no-till agriculture that's providing us with some great benefits but we're having a lot of residue on the ground year-round that poses a fire risk and so this might this slide here is me trying to think about how much how much energy can we expect from fires that occur in Kim Fallow fields. So first off on the left-hand side here, we have a fire characteristics chart, which it's a little over overwhelming at first, but basically on the vertical axis, axis, you have the rate of spread in feet per minute. So how fast is the fire moving? And then on the horizontal axis, how much heat per square foot is being generated from that fire? And then what you have is you have basically four different lines here, ISO lines, that are following what the fire intensity is. And so fire intensity correlates with how well we can actually get in there and suppress the fire. The greater the fire intensity, the more likely we're gonna be going uh, inter indirect, meaning that we're not directly putting the fire out, we're building a box and putting a fire break way out in front of it, hoping it's gonna stop. Or we get a very minimal fire intensity, which allows us to basically get out there with our shovels and effectively put it out. So that's kind of this chart here. And so each line here, the first one's uh, flame lengths of four feet, eight, 11, 15. For the most part, if the flame lengths are four feet or less, we can easily get in there and engage with the fire. They get over four feet, that's when we're gonna be using tractors and discs, bulldozers. And then once we get over eight feet, you really don't wanna begin that close with a disc to it either. And so then up here, I've basically looked at, we think about how many, how large of a crop you're going to have. Often we're looking at 50 to 60 bushel crop. Uh, this year it's been so dry, we might be looking at a 30 bushel crop, but typically we're getting about three tons of residue on the soil surface. And so that three tons, that's just the residue. So that's, you know, we have a 60 bushel crop, we go through there, we harvest the grain, we're still going to be left with three tons of residue on the ground. And then we look at this bottom chart how much heat is going to be generated by that much fuel being consumed. And so, you know, typically with three tons per acre, we're going to be looking at 1200 BTUs per, per square foot. And three tons per acre is kind of what NRCS and other conservation districts would say, you know, that's ideally we're leaving two to three tons on the ground for soil health that, you know, hopefully will be there during the summer. People do different management strategies. So often late in the summer, we might be looking at more, more around two tons or even one ton, depending on how dry it is. But I'm just trying to demonstrate that with all that residue, we could potentially be creating a lot of fire behavior. So the line that I just had pop up, assuming that we're only getting 300 feet, um, 
per square foot generated. So, you know, very minimal soil residue on the soil surface. We can see that the that fire can be moving um, Once the fire gets moving fairly quickly, it's going to be hard to keep it within that four foot zone. But basically, you see with that little residue, the fire can still be moving up to up to a point, and we can easily keep those flame lengths under four feet and engage with the fire. But if we've got 1,200 tons, 1,200 BTUs being created by three tons of residue, that's run up here in the black line, and you can see it's a very small window of opportunity for us to engage that with hand tools. And similarly, there's a very limited uh, window that we can engage with that with tractors and discs as well. So just trying to have a better understanding of what sort of fire risk we actually have on the landscape out there. This photo is just simply showing what different types of residue looks like. And so basically, you know, the two tons, 63, 100 pounds to the acre. So you divide that by two to get tons to the acre. And so, you know, it's a little bit over three tons to the acre. You can see there's a lot of residue there that's going to generate some fire behavior. But as we get to having only 15% cover at 225 pounds to the acre, you know, that's looking more like traditional fowl almost at that point. So one strategy is what can we do to mitigate the hazards of our standing residue? We can't do much with our wheat crop when we're trying, waiting to harvest it. But if we have Kim Fowl fields, maybe there are some things we can do to um, mitigate the risk that that potentially poses. And so this picture here is of a turbo tiller or a vertical tillage implement. So basically, instead of traditional tillage that's kind of causing horizontal and vertical disturbance, this goes through and it's only reorganizing, basically just vertically lifting that soil off the ground and putting it back on. And so this picture here, it's also a video, but I think we're running out a little short for me to play the whole video. But the gist of this is that this field right behind me is at the Sherman Experiment Station. It's been turbo tilled. And so you can see looking at that soil service, we still have residue there that's standing, but it's not like our traditional no-till residue that's standing upright and really looks ex extremely flammable. And in Sherman County, there are a few producers in the habit that they will go around the borders of their fields with a turbo tiller in the spring and the primary reason they're doing that is because then the next fall when they go in there to seed it, they can more easily get their no-till drill around those tight corners by having the soil slightly disturbed in this manner so that they're able to reseed those corners much more effectively. The other helpful thing is those corners are on the edges of the field. And so they have found that if they suddenly have a wildfire that they're trying to disc the field, they only have to go through this you know, once or twice and they have a very effective fuel break compared to if they were trying to put that disc line into a traditional Kim fallow field. So they're kind of helping themselves agronomically with the no-till when they go to seed it. And then if they have a fire, they can more quickly put in an effective fuel break without having to put as many disc lines into that Kim fowl to make it be effective. The other thing to think about creating defensible space, are there areas that we can put alternative crops that are maybe gonna help mitigate wildfire behavior? And so anecdotally, we have heard stories about canola being a good crop that can at times dramatically relax fire behavior. And in other cases, it can also increase fire behavior. The bottom photo here is showing a practice that's called pushing the canola. So basically they're flattening the canola so that it will senesce and mature faster and more evenly. And then they go through here with a uh, a hay combine basically and harvest this. And people have found that when they push this down like this and it gets really dry and then they have a fire, suddenly they've got a very dense fuel bed that they can expect more, they can expect increased fire behavior in this. And then this is what canola looks like right at harvest. Um, you can see it looks pretty dry. The other issue is with canola, it's you know, you get canola oil from it. So it's very volatile that if the seed pods get high enough that they start going, you can have very hot black smoke being, being produced by these. But the caveat is you can see there's a lot of increased openings uh, on the surface here underneath the plants that it's more spread out than a wheat crop would be. Thinking about residue, canola residue looks like this with these punji sticks. It's gonna be pretty hard for a fire to come through this. 
So that's another benefit that before harvest and after harvest, canola in some strategic locations could be a very effective way to control wildfires. The other issue we have in agricultural areas is we have these fence lines that often we're not actually using to keep our cows in anymore. And so we're kind of letting them get, get in a little bit rougher shape. So if you have a bunch of these wooden posts, that poses a wildfire risk. The other thing is look at the vegetation and weeds that get stuck along this fence. That's kind of the larger issue here. And so one strategy is this is a fence cleaner that was manufactured in Oklahoma that they're cleaning their fence lines with. So I'm not saying that we should all go out and get a fence cleaner, but the idea is fairly similar that we have areas that we are collecting litter and other plant material and other annual grasses and forbs are really thriving on these fence lines. Sometimes taking care of that fence line could really help improve wildfire defensible space in some key locations. The other thing is Ariel mentioned trying to manage our nice shady trees in spot. The same issue is true with agriculture that we have a lot of these incentive programs like uh, CRP and CREP that we are getting, landowners are getting assistance to uh, improve riparian health by adding um, cover through trees and shrubs. Often with CRP, we're seeding in um, very thick stands of native grass and introduced grasses sometimes that can pose a wildfire threat. And so these trees look great here, but just I'm encouraging people when you have crap areas, understand that they can create an additional wildfire hazard when it gets really hot and dry in the summer. Similarly, it's great to see the creek this shaded. However, we need to think about the, the hazards that this is also posing. And so I'm not suggesting that we go through, we completely denude the creeks. That's not the solution. We need the cover here to improve water quality, but think more about what you're doing on the borders of your crap and CRP fields. Can you create some increased, increased defensible space on those edges? So when you do have a fire that gets involved in these heavy fuels, when it's really hot and dry, you can still put it out successfully without it spreading to other areas. I really like this photo because it shows some great defensible space being created on this farm. You can see a lot of gravel, clear space around the barn. The house has a nice green lawn. Um, these trees could potentially be an issue, but as long as they're kept green and there's some space created, they are spread out, so that's good. The other thing is that you can see, I think, I mean, this field almost looks like it's in a traditional CRP program with the grasses that are in it. They've got this nice mode strip right here that if something did happen with the fire going through there, it's going to basically go out once it hits the short mode green grass here. And so another thing we can think about is where can we put a fuel break in that's going to help not necessarily put the fire out, but allow the wildfire to, the fire behavior to be relaxed enough that we can safely engage it and put it out at that point. And similarly, I'm going to go through some steps here that you can create fuel breaks, but think about areas on your farm that you might have some rocky scab ground that would be a good spot that you would anticipate if a fire was going through there it would hit that and you'd see much more relaxed fire behavior and you can actually put it out. So obviously with the fuel break, we're trying to dis disrupt that fuel continuity. We're trying to reduce the amount of fuel that's on the landscape in that area. We're trying to change the fire behavior with the volatility of the fuels. It's so like I was saying, uh, canola at times can have increased volatility if it is high enough to really start burning. Rabbit brush, um, there's some other uh, shrubs, even sagebrush sometimes that have increased volatility that will burn extra hot. And then the other issue is that we have a lot of annual grasses that dry out quickly, get very crispy and a very low moisture. So if we're able to find vegetation that has higher moisture later into the fire season, there's a good chance that's gonna be an effective fuel break. So considerations for fuel breaks, we need to think about the scale. So I was kind of talking about how we can expect fairly impressive flame lengths from dryland wheat and other annual grasses that get into some of these spots. And we're also concerned about embers flying. So, you know, often they say a minimum, you know, a 20 foot fire break where you've got very limited vegetation. And then with a fuel break, you're going to want, you know, potentially 100 feet. Often in 
Boise and other areas of the Great Basin that they're using fuel breaks, they're often, you know, 100 feet on either side of an already existing gravel road. So you're looking at, you know, potentially 200 feet wide. And so 100 foot wide fuel break is still potentially going to be effective, but the 200 foot one is going to be the most effective, most likely. We want fuel breaks to be strategic. Where are we placing them? Are we placing them in smart areas that the fire behavior is going to be relaxed? Um, and again, we're trying to be economical with these. And so this picture here shows some of the different means we can alter vegetation on the landscape to create fuel breaks. So one option is their traditional field side disking or roadside improvement that often it's the annuals we're controlling. You're going to be looking at 30 to $50 per acre per year. So it's a very timely um, form, of form of creating a fuel break, but they can be extremely effective because of this mineral soil that you're seeing here. Other big things with roads improvement for fire breaks, these mohawks where you have a lot of grass growing can really be a detrimental during a, a wildfire that uh, suppression resources aren't gonna be very happy to be doing a burnout or to be trying to stop a fire, obviously at a road when you've got so much grass growing in the middle, along with the height of the grass in the surrounding areas. Often we're seeing agencies such as the BLM, they're using sprayed fuel breaks that often they don't have time to do a disc line. So at least if they're spraying plateau or mazapic type herbicides, they're gonna effectively control those annual grasses there. And again, this is a very expensive annual maintenance activity Often once you get the annuals controlled, they can come back in and seed it with something that's going to stay there, some sort of perennial grass, hopefully. We can also have a mowed fuel break that we're going through there and we're mowing to reduce the height of the fuels in that area so that we can more better put the fire out. So again, this can be expensive. You're doing it after several years. Grazed fuel breaks are now kind of the hip thing that BLM is doing down by Boise, Idaho. And you know it's great that the cows are getting some forage out of this. Often it's fairly low quality that they're getting though, however. And it works if you have cows. If you have to go borrow your neighbor's cows and it's a big transportation cost and expense, it might not work out so great. Other challenges is that you know, you've got to think about infrastructure. How are you going to keep the cows focused in that one key area that you're trying to put your fuel break in? And so different strategies that have been used obviously fencing, high infrastructure costs there and time. Herders are some of the most effective, but again, that can be expensive. Or if you're trying to do this on your own, that the time commitment of doing that is gonna be uh, detrimental to trying to do that. Also, where are you putting water and supplements on your farm? You can simply just move your water and your salt blocks around to really change some grazing behavior as well effectively. The other, most expensive upfront, but cheaper over the long run solution for a fuel break is using a green strip that you're finding perennial vegetation that you're going to plant in the ground. And hopefully it's going to stay there for, you know, 20, 30 years down the road once you get it established. And it's going to be a very effective area with higher fuel moisture that when that fire comes through, it's going to dramatically slow down. So forage kosha is what has often been used in Boise, Idaho. I'm doing some research to see, you know, how well this can work here. I'm thinking in the mid-Columbia region, usually we have slightly more moisture than Boise. So I think some of these are going to establish better even here than they do in, in Idaho. Another thing here, this photo here is showing these, this, you can see a lot of open spaces between the plants here. And historically, in the mid-Columbia and other parts of Eastern Oregon, we had these inner spaces that were devoid of fuel. And so fire behavior was very relaxed. However, now in the background of this picture, you can see the cheatgrass is moving into those inner spaces. And so we have a very continuous fuel bed. So the other thing is just simply trying to put perennial vegetation down that's gonna keep the cheatgrass out and create good, safe inner spaces that the fire is gonna slow down dramatically in when it gets into. Other plants to consider, I'm running out of time here, but just real briefly, blue flax, Yarrow is a very effective one that's been used in some areas of the mid-Columbia. You can see that green, the very green small leaves on it are very effective. Sometimes you do have to go through and mow or graze it on a periodic basis, you know, maybe once a year, once or twice a year to really encourage this green growth to stay there. 
So we're going to fast forward here because we're running out of time. But the big takeaway that I want to end with is how do we prioritize where we take these actions? And so this image here, we're looking north. So consider where are the, when, where are the dominant winds coming from? Depending on the area, often we see that we get strong winds from the west or the east. And in this location, the winds predominantly are coming from the west. So we have our west side here that if a fire is coming, the winds can be pushing it towards the house through this area. You also have a steep slope here that kind of lines up like this with the orange. And another thing that Ariel pointed out is it's really the flashy fields that we have to be concerned with dealing with. And so the, the oak, oak trees in the surrounding background here, those could pose an issue if we had extreme fire behavior but it's mainly the flashy fuels in the open part here that we're most concerned about. So you line up all these different factors and this should be your priority area right here where all those areas overlap and that should be your area that you should prioritize focusing on first. And again, slope can play a major role in influencing the rate and spread of fires. This is just very quickly showing that basically they say as a general rule of thumb, with every 10 degree increase, you're gonna see flame lengths double. And you can definitely see the rate of fire spread doubles as well. So we're basically out of time here. Other thing too to think about, if you have uh, sprinklers that you can establish on your farm, those can be really helpful. Having large areas of gravity fed backup water can also help. Installing these large tanks are expensive, but once you get them installed, they can be very helpful. Um, and again, there's the program, there's the FireWise program that if you go to www.firewise.org, you'll see resources there. They have opportunities to try to pay for some things. I've heard of agricultural producers getting money to pay for buried water tanks for um, wildfire purposes through that program. So it might be worth looking at that. So again, like Ariel, I also have a survey here you can fill out. I have a box of an online folder with resources, um, which I'm going to also upload a few more from today up on. If you take a photo of that with your phone or go to that link, you'll be able to find that box there. So now if you have any, any questions, feel free to stick around. It is past in the webinar time here. So if you have to leave, I appreciate your attendance today. And this webinar recording will be posted to YouTube at some point. So just to follow up, I'm looking at the chat here for questions. And ever, uh, I did not notice during my presentation, but attendees are pointing out things to think about with the fence wall space in that barn photo. And most majority of you are, are pointing out it's really the dead weeds at the side of the barn are the greatest greatest threat that needs to be addressed along with ember shower concerns as well. So feel free to put in the Q&A or chat if you have a question. I know we threw a lot of information at you, at you this afternoon and I think Errol brought up a great point that it's kind of more of a, a long-term process that you can't do it all in one year, but try to address that priority area first and then get to those other areas when you're able to.